Good morning. Good to be here this morning. Nice day outside, a little cool. The answer to the question in John 1 48. What did Jesus really mean when he told Nathaniel that he saw him under the fig tree? But I don't know the correct answer. I, I have seen some answers given, but none of them really stand out to me. But here is what I have come up with in, in my studies. The, freak, the fig tree in the east is considered a sacred tree a symbol of prosperity. Its shadow is beautiful and restful. Often when mothers were out in the fields working, they placed their babies under a fig tree for shade and hopefully prosperity. It is indeed an interesting sight to see babies sleeping and small children playing in the shadow of these trees. When Jesus told Nathanael that he saw him under the fig tree, possibly he meant that he had known him since he was a baby. And now we can understand why Nathanael, when Jesus told him, said, I, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael was thinking back that, yes, when he was a child or a baby, then undoubtedly he proclaimed, said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. He realized that Jesus, who knew him back then, was indeed the Son of God. The question for next week will come later, so pay attention. In your Bibles, in Joshua, the 5th chapter, 13th, and following verses, and it came to pass when Joshua was by, was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face on the, to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of, of valor. Shall we pray? Our eternal Father, we thank you, O Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you, O Lord, for your son Jesus who died upon Calvary for the remission of our sins, and we ask that you will forgive us of our sins. We pray, O oh Lord, for the families who have lost their business because of the riot and the insane way people are acting now and the looters who have gone in and destroyed and taken from other people. We pray, O oh Lord, for the healing of our nation, both physically and spiritually. And we pray, O oh Lord, for those who are sick. We ask that you will lay thy healing hand upon them and we pray for those who have lost some loved one. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will comfort them. Now guide us, O oh Lord, as we study thy word, that thy Holy Spirit may guide us and strengthen us, for it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Joshua, we talked about several weeks ago, facing challenges. Joshua had faced his first challenge when he was going across the Jordan River. Now he had crossed the Jordan River and he was facing another seemingly impossible challenge. After crossing the Jordan, the Israelites were eating of the food of the land. As you read in the scripture, it says, 
the day after they, when they went into the pro promised land, crossed the Jordan, went into the promised land, and they were eating of the abundant food that God had provided in Canaan. And the day after that they had eaten the food, the manna ceased. Well, after 40 years of eating manna, it ceased. And I've often wondered what did they do that day when they were eating, the first time they were eating other food other than manna. Did they just leave the manna sitting or did they eat of the manna also? We don't know. But after they had entered into the promised land, while they were in the wilderness, the Israelites had stopped doing the Passover. They had stopped obeying God in uh, circumcision. So they had stopped now and they had camped and Joshua instituted circumcision and the Passover. I should say reinstituted. And at, as they were healing and recuperating from their surgery, Joshua was standing there looking at Jericho, contemplating perhaps what was going to take place. He was looking at a city fortified by a double ring of walls. The outer wall was six foot thick. And the inner wall was 12 feet thick, covering about six or seven acres. There was space between the walls, and timbers were laid across the walls, and on these timbers they built houses. So this is sort of like the house that Rahab had. She had a house on these timbers. So since Jericho was built on a hill, it could only be taken by going up a steep incline which would put the Israelites at a great disadvantage. When a person or an army attacked a fort, they normally used a siege of several months to face their opponents into surrender through starvation. Joshua had laid siege, but it would not take him several months to conquer Jericho. So I said Joshua was contemplating, possibly with his head bowed, thinking about what was he going to do, how was he going to get past Jericho, how was he going to conquer this great, these great walls. And all of a sudden he looked up and there was a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn. Now, when Joshua saw him, he said, first thing came out of his mouth, he said, are you for us or against us? And the man didn't really answer his question. He says, I have given you Jericho. And Joshua fell on his knees, his face prostrate, and worshiped this man, this commander. And the question is, and there's different ideals who the commander was, but when you stop and think about it, the commander said, Take off your shoes, for you are a holy ground. It didn't say, get up and don't worship me because I am an angel or I'm not to be worshipped. He said, take your sandals off, indicating that this was Christ himself. How could it be Christ? How could Christ be appears in a man. He hadn't been born yet. Well, the scriptures tell us that Jesus told the Pharisees when he was looking at them, he said, before Abraham was, I was. And we look in John, the first chapter, we find that Jesus said, uh, the, uh, John said that Jesus was there in before the creation of the world. And Jesus told the Pharisees and, and the scribes, he says, God and I are one. So he's always been here. Joshua did not realize that when he came face with face with the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, a Christophany, we studied about that in the Bible study. We talked about theophany, we talked about Christophany, and this undoubtedly was a Christophany, which happens several times in the Bible. This is the appearance of Christ in a different form. I heard one commentator say, 
or I read it, I guess, for my sake. It said, well, I said, it wasn't God because he couldn't look at God. Well, we know better than that because we go back to Genesis. We find that when the angels appeared to Abraham and were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, that God was in that group. He was a theophany. He appeared as a human being. God who created us can do whatever he wants to do. So he had no idea that he was standing in the presence of God. It's sort of like it's reminiscent of Moses. You remember when Moses was on the mount and burning bush and all of a sudden God says, take your shoes off, you're standing on holy ground. Joshua was told the same thing. Little. You know, we go through life and we do things and we talk to people and we have no idea what's going to transpire years later. If I meet someone, I talk to someone and we both die, years down the road, that someone that I talked to could have been an ancestor of someone important years later, serving God, ministering to God, whatever. This is what happened with Joshua. Joshua didn't know. He had no idea of the events that were going to unfold, that they would play a big role in the genealogy of the coming of Messiah. We've got to stop and think, what's going on here? We talked about Rahab. We've talked about Rahab before. And now we're talking about perhaps uh, Christ appearing as the commander of the army. That Joshua had no idea as he was talking to this person that it was indeed Jesus Christ who would later come back to earth in the form of a, a baby. And there's something else he didn't realize then that we'll get into. Lord tells Jesus, Says, and we see it in the scripture, it says, the Lord told Joshua, I said Jesus, the Lord told Joshua, Joshua and Jesus the same thing. You look in, you know, in the scriptures or uh, definition of the name, Joshua, Jesus, same. But anyway, he told Joshua, I'm going to give you Jericho. But, you have to do something. It's so like we say that salvation is free. We hear that all the time, salvation is free. It's not free. Nothing's free. I had, years ago in, in Bible study, down at First Baptist Church, we had Bible study on Thursdays. We got together. And we're talking to one, one guy, we're, we're good friends, still good friends. He said, well, salvation is free. I said, no, it's not. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's not free. He said, well, it is. It's there. I said, yeah, it's there. But it's not free. So what do you mean? I said, well, if I laid a $5 bill down on this table, I said, here, it's free. It's yours. Now, is that $5 bill going to jump up into your pocket? No. You have to do something. You have to get up and walk up and pick up that pot out of him and put it in your pocket. So it is with salvation. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in order to receive salvation. It's free if you accept it. So Joshua, he was telling, God was telling Joshua, said, listen, I'm going to give you Jericho. The battle is won, but you have to do something first. So Joshua said, okay, what am I got to do? He said, here's what you got to do. Then I want you to put your armed men in front. And Joshua is to lead these people. You got to picture this. Joshua is in the front. Here is the armed guards behind him. And the most important thing 
that will follow is after the priest. Seven priests blowing seven trumpets. They will walk around Jericho, the walls of Jericho, for seven days. And on the seventh day, they will go around seven times. Seven means completeness. So it's going to be a complete carry out of God's purpose and plan. So he put the priest in front with seven horns, seven trumpets. Then after the priest, we want the Kohites to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Then after the Ark of the Covenant, we want the armed guard behind. I don't know how many people there were. I've wondered. The Bible doesn't say, and I haven't read any words where anybody came up with an idea. But it said, this is what I want you to do. I want them to go. The Ark of Covenant is the presence of God. It symbolized God's presence among the people. Just like we come to this house. It's symbolic of God's presence among his people when we've got it together. It isn't the church. We're the church. He said, I want you to march around the wall. One time. I want the, the priest to blow the trumpets. Now, it wasn't a musical ensemble. It was a blowing of Preparing the war, when they blow the trumpet, it means an announcement of something or uh, prepare to go to war. It wasn't a musical ensemble. It wasn't some kind of song, How Great Thou Art, or whatever. So he said, the trump, they are to blow the trumpets. As you walk, go around this wall. Not say a word. You can't say a word. You can't even murmur or whisper. No sound. A bizarre military strategy of marching around Jericho gave occasion for the Israelites to take God as his word. And it would also heighten the people in Jericho their uneasiness. Can you imagine, I mean, here you are in this fortified city thinking that you're safe, nobody can get in. Here comes this ragtag army and they're just marching around, blowing the trumpets and just walking around, not saying a word. Only thing that they heard was the trumpet blowing and the stomping of the feet as they marched. I don't know what they thought, but you can imagine that they said, let, let, let them people down there. Look at them crazy people. What do they think they're doing? So they go march around the walls. Then they go back to the camp. Jer the people in Jericho, I don't know, like I said, I don't know what they thought, but I can imagine. But they said, what's going on? What's this? What are they trying to do? So the next morning, early in the morning, here they come again. They get up. And they go around the walls of Jericho. The same ritual. Day three, day four. I can imagine by this time the people of Jericho are saying, ah, they're crazy. Forget it. Don't worry about it. But we find that in all of this, all this marching around the wall, we find an obedience of faith on the part of the Israelites to march around the city once a day for six days. And seven times on the seventh day, which imposed a great strain, you might say, on the nation's loyalty and obedience. They didn't know what was going on. They had no idea what was taking place. They were doing what Joshua told them to do. And you have to think, you know, they thought quite a bit of Joshua in order to be obedient to him to do what he wanted him to do. They did. He probably said, God, this is what God wants us to do. And they said, well, we would do it. And they did. Day seven comes. 
They get up and they begin to march and we can think, see the inhabitants of Jericho think, you know, um, well, here they go again. Here they come again. There's those people marching around here again. Well, something different happened. They made the trip around the walls of Jericho and they didn't go back to the camp. All of a sudden, here they come again. Well, maybe they'll go back this time. No, they didn't. The third time, here they come. The fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, the seventh time. All of a sudden, after going around seven times, the blast of the ram's horns changed. It became a blast that began to resonate and grow in, in strength and loudness. And then all of a sudden, the people began to shout. I don't know what they shouted. They may say, blessed God, Hosanna to God, whatever, I don't know. But they began to shout, and they began to get louder and louder and louder. The trumpets louder and the people louder, and all of a sudden they... The people of Jericho were beginning to wonder. What are they doing? What are they doing? And all of a sudden, the outer wall began to fall down the incline. And then the second wall began to fall. And the Israelites went up into Jericho. Now it gets a little tricky. You have to visualize that what happened here, there was walls around the city and we're talking about there are houses on the walls and Rahab's house was on the walls because she let the two spies down by red cord on the outer wall. So if the wall fell down, how could Rahab be inspired? But she would be. I think what happened when they went in, the wall that Rahab's house was on did not fall until she was removed. She was saved by God. And after her family came out of the house and came down and were taken out of Jericho, that wall fell too. Now Joshua had told the people, he said, now listen, here's what you are to do. You're to go in to Jericho. You're to kill everything. Oh, that's cruel. Everybody. Man, woman, and child, you're to kill everyone. But why would God do that? We reach a point in our lives. I say ours, everybody. You may reach a point in your life when there's no turning back. We talk about, you know, plane goes to the point of no return. You don't have enough fuel to go forward or go back. You just you don't have enough to go back. You got enough to go forward. So you can't go back. You don't pass the point of no return. And I think that's true with men. And we don't realize that there's a point time in your life and our lives unless we repent of our sin and accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. There's a point in our life where there's no turning back. God knows that you're not going to change. It's like Pharaoh. You remember Pharaoh? God knew that Pharaoh would never change, was never going to accept him. So he said, okay, you made the choice. And so it was with Jericho. They were paganistic people. God knew they were never going to change, so he said, you made your choice now. Judgment has come. But the beautiful thing of it is that these little kids, God did them a favor. We've said this before. God did them a favor. Had they had grown up in this paganistic society, they would become pagans and died and went to hell. But in the 
stage of infancy, God took them to heaven. He spared them. He done them a favor. And then Joshua said, don't take anything out of there except the vessels of silver and gold. Nothing else. Nothing else. And then you are to burn everything. Believe me. They go in. They killed everybody there. They killed all the animals. Only the silver, gold, the vessels of brass and iron were consecrated when they were captured. Consecrated to God. Or so they thought. Now the question is, what happened? That's for next week. Joshua said, go bring Rahab. The second thing that Joshua wasn't aware of, that here was the woman, he had been talking possibly to Christ, pre-incarnate Christ, not realizing that he would come back as the Messiah, the promised Messiah that everybody had been looking for. And now he had saved this prostitute because of the promise that they made to her, her and her family. Little did he realize that this woman that he, they had brought out of Jericho would be the great, great grandmother of the King David, who would later give rise to the Messiah. See, we never know what happens after we go. I wonder if he had known would it change anything? Probably not. All the glory was to be the Lord. The victory was so obviously God's doing that Joshua and the people took no part of his glory. In chapter 6 of Joshua, the 26th verse, Joshua puts a curse. And we talked about this in Bible study. Joshua put a curse on Jericho. He said, if anyone tries to rebuild Jericho, the oldest son will die when they build the foundation, the youngest son will die when they put up the gates. A curse. A curse that came true. In 1 Kings 16th chapter 34th verse, we find that indeed that happened. But Jericho was rebuilt. But at a price. That could be another question. How many Jerichos were there? But anyway. When we are obedient to God. We will never know. We never know what he will bless us with. You go through life and you serve God. And you do what he wants to do. And, and you go through trials and tribulations. And you wonder. So like that song Chris Christopherson sings. Why me, Lord? What am I doing? Well, we've done a lot of things in our lives. And we're thankful that God is the merciful God that he is that will forgive us of our sins when we ask him to forgive us. We never know. I look back on my life and I see how God has blessed me through my life. Blessed my family. Joshua was blessed by God because of his faith in God. How strong is our faith in God, shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your service. We thank you, O Lord, for Calvary Baptist Church and your flock. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would guide us, strengthen us, 
again we offer our petitions that you may bring about the cure for this virus. Again we ask, O oh Lord, that you will heal our land, that we may become a nation indeed under God. Lead us through this week. Bless us in a special way. For it's in Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. Amen.